So very good morning, uh, all the participants. Uh, we are into day three of uh, the FDP on quantum computing algorithms and machine learning, organized uh, by in the, in the sponsorship of Atal FDP program and uh, RB College of Engineering. So just have a quick uh, recap of uh, what has happened uh, yesterday. Dr. Shesha from IBM, he gave a wonderful overview of uh, areas of quantum applications, quantum chemistry, quantum machine learning, quantum Monte Carlo, quantum optimizations, loans and credit scoring, battery research, and also he emphasized on uh, the Moore's law versus uh, exponential speed ups, quantum chip, quantum infrastructure per se, working of quantum circuits, then developer ecosystem, quantum programming flow, static circuit versus dynamic circuit, and also he has given a detailed overview of QSKIT resources, and also kind of mentioned about uh, the upcoming NPTEL uh, course from IBM. So we hope all of you would definitely take the benefit of NPTEL program, which is coming up. The registrations, I uh, think they started. Following uh, Dr. Shesha's session is uh, Dr. Archana from IBM. She gave uh, a session on uh, quantum algorithm, uh, Dai Joza and uh, Bunsen Wazirani algorithms. She discussed about algorithms complexity per se and query complexity quantum complexity. She gave an overall picture of how the algorithm complexities has to be measured and uh, role of superposition in uh, algorithms, especially in DJ and uh, BV algorithms. And also she shown uh, uh, demonstrations. Following her session uh, is our circuit researcher, Mr. Keshav and Mr. Shivam. Uh, took you through completely the detailed implementation of these two algorithms and also they have shared with you the the Python notebooks uh, for for you to kind of uh, practice. So this was the uh, coverage uh, for yesterday. So moving for today's uh, commitments uh, we have coming up is at 9.30, uh, we are past 9.30. So Dr. Dinagaran Vinayak Murthy, from IBM speaking about Schwarz and Grauer's algorithm. These two are really uh, very uh, pro prominent algorithms in the today's quantum world. I wish all of you should focus a lot here. Then uh, following his session would be the quantum cryptography session by Dr. Arpita Maitra from TCG Crest, Kolkata. And in the afternoon, uh, we go for practical implementation of these uh, algorithms with IBM QSKIT from Archit and Dan Single. So this is the coverage for uh, today. So I, I request uh, Minal to uh, go for introducing formally uh, the speaker. Yes, sure. So good morning everyone and welcome on the third day of FDP on quantum computing algorithms and machine learning. Today, once again, we have with us Dr. Dinakaran Vinayagamurthy from IBM. He is working as a researcher, cryptographer, and IBM quantum ambassador. Dr. Dina has a bachelor degree in computer science and engineering. He has completed his master in uh, computer science from University of Toronto, Canada. He is a PhD from University of Waterloo in computer science and engineering, exclusively in quantum information. Uh, Dr. Dinakaran has published many papers in reputed journal and conference. Uh, sir, we wholeheartedly welcome you here in RBC as a part of this Friday FDP, and I request you to start the session. Over to you, yes, sir. Okay. Yeah, thanks for the introduction. Thanks for uh, inviting me here. Uh, can you be sharing your screen? Yes, yes. yes, sir. Your screen is visible. Okay. Okay. Yeah. Uh, Right, nice to be in RBC again, uh, giving a talk. I think for the last 12 months, this is my third talk. Every six months, uh, there's a session on quantum computing or a workshop going on. So 
it's happy to see that in Bangalore there is a lot of interest uh, growing. And I think last two times it was for students. It's the first time talking to a set of faculty. So yeah, extremely excited. Okay, so this session will be on uh, two algorithms which are prominent in the quantum computing literature. First is the uh, Grover's and Schar's, right? Uh, I'll first go through Grover's and then Schar's. Uh, before that, I'll just briefly recap the timeline and uh, the high level picture that uh, Achana mentioned yesterday, right? It's always good to recap the high level picture before going to the details of uh, a specific algorithm and in a historic context also how it comes in, right? So in general, when Feynman like, uh, motivated quantum computing in the early 1980s, the goal, I mean, there was no powerful classical computers at that point. They were like uh, very primitive at that point. But uh, the goal then was that uh, they had the belief that quantum computers can solve something faster than classical computers because nature is quantum in nature. Uh, yeah, nature is inherently quantum. And uh, the computing paradigm that was heavily researched at that point, the classical paradigm of bit zero and one, uh, was known to be limiting inherently. So that's what prompted Feynman to say that, oh, oh you can do uh, many things uh, if you have a computer based on what nature, what we believe nature is uh, working with, right? So initially, as Ashina mentioned, the first problems were toy problems. They didn't really care about real world applications. And in particular, as she mentioned, oh yeah, uh, Simon did not even believe, and he and his advice, advisor did not even believe in the power of quantum computing. I think his advisor doesn't still believe. Uh, so the goal they had was to come up with a problem, uh, come up with a proof that quantum computing is not more powerful. But then they ended up finding a problem which is uh, which quantum computers can solve exponentially faster than a classical computer. This remain is one of contribution. Dan Simon is a cryptographer, so he uh, I think this was his only result in quantum computing. Maybe that's why he missed because. Char like essentially like uh, built upon Simon's algorithm. If you see Simon's algorithm and then if you look at Char's, it's uh, almost straightforward, you can say. But only the person like uh, Peter Char, who he was already an expert in quantum computing, he was already a professor. Uh, I think he was a researcher in AT&T Labs, if not already a professor at MIT. He he was already like uh, well into quantum computing research. He believed in the power of it. So once he saw the result of Dan Simon, he immediately like realized that oh, this could do much more powerful things. The the techniques that he developed, even though he uh, studied it for a toy problem, he realized that it could do much more powerful things. For instance, it can break uh, the RSA crypto system in the sense that uh, it can solve the prime factoring problem in polynomial time. Uh, so just to recap, prime factoring is a problem where you have two large primes, P and Q. Okay, uh, it can be any primes, but uh, to solve top like choice algorithm, but RSA crypto system uses two large primes with specific properties. And if you have a product of this prime, uh, the entire crypto system is built on the belief that it's hard to factor this uh, number N into the primes, the individual primes P and Q, right? The modern internet, a bulk of it, uh, it's it's based on RSA crypto system also, right? I mean, there are two, three crypto systems which form the basis of the modern internet, a TLS, uh, using which we use secure communication over the internet. But typically in a system, we need everything to be secure. We cannot like uh, expect one of the like steps of this communication to be secure because uh, the other step, if it's broken, it's as good as nothing is secure. So, uh, so RSA crypto system is still a foundation, one of the, Core foundations of uh, TLS uh, protocol. And in the 90s, when 1994, I think, when Shah published his paper, this prompted a huge interest in uh, quantum computing in, in, in general. Because till then, I think the quantum computing was considered like a bit uh, extraneous because there were other, all, other forms of computing also. I think uh, DNA computing, I don't know the timeline of those, but they in addition to the class, traditional classical, people are studying many other forms of computing also. And quantum computing was given the same level of respect as those, 
But then once Shah gave this algorithm, serious interest started, serious funding was invested by government and various uh, folks because they thought, okay, RSA is the foundation for secure communication. So if someone can build a quantum computer, we have to be careful. So that was, that prompted a, uh, like a huge interest in the field of uh, quantum computing. And then after that, uh, Grover uh, gave the next uh, real world use case for a quantum computing, which is a quadratic improvement in search over unstructured data. So you have unstructured uh, data, which you don't assume any properties on the structure of the list in your searching from. So Grover said that uh, quantum computer can do quadratically faster than any classic computer. I mean, uh, unlike the exponential improvement Shor claimed in theory, Grover as an algorithm is just quadratic improvement, but still it's very interesting because it's like uh, right now you have like huge amounts of data. So if something takes a week or a month, sorry, if something takes a month, you can do it in a couple of days. That's what a quadratic improvement means, right? Uh, if the constants are also proper. So uh, yeah, this is also a big deal, right? And after that things move forward, uh, there were quite a few interesting quantum algorithms proposed by various researchers in the meantime for different uh, uh, interesting mathematical building blocks, right? And uh, recently people have started in the last five, six years, uh, last half a decade, people have started researching on even more concrete problems like general optimization problems. And also they started focusing on the things that, okay, that for the next decade or two, we are going to have a noisy quantum computer with uh, intermediate level number of qubits, let's say hundreds or thousands of few thousands number of qubits, which are noisy, or you'll have perfect qubits in the order of tens, right? So they started looking at the general optimization problems like VQE and QAOA. And uh, yeah, like a very good important milestone that we are proud of inside IBM is IBM is the first to introduce quantum computing with cloud because till then it's like, uh, it's like what you see 50 years ago, you have a room only those, uh, I don't know, like special permissions, people with special permissions can access the computer. But here, after it, uh, quantum computer has been made access to the cloud, at that point it was just a five qubit quantum computer. It was super noisy. It's essentially like uh, maybe the power of one or two bits, like quantum bits, right? But uh, still like we have made the leap to make it available in cloud. And now uh, every new quantum computer, uh, sorry, computer is in some form of the other, in some, Pricing mechanism or it's free, it's available. And this lead to a lot of research in concrete real value skills, like Sesha mentioned, like either in the finance domain, pricing contracts, or in battery optimization and here. This lecture, uh, I will focus on Shar and Grover's algorithm. Okay. Uh, yesterday you saw Joy Shears and Bernstein was running that introduce you to some basic building blocks. Shar and Grover's algorithm will take it to the next level. Uh, in using them. So I will give a, a pretty comprehensive overview of Grover's algorithm, but Shard's algorithm will take two, three hours in like by itself to give a, like a comprehensive detailed uh, description. So I will try to go over the high level details uh, and uh, you guys can stop me for questions. So depending on the time we have, uh, I will decide the level of details I'll go in for Shard's algorithm. And also, since the theory is all heavy enough, I'm I thought of skipping the Kiskit part of it because uh, to implement Kiskit, I have to go to one more level of detail, so that will take some time. So for today's lecture, I'll cover the theory part of Grover's algorithm and the theory overview of Schwarz algorithm. All right. Uh, again, just like a one slide summary of uh, query complexity. If you remember from yesterday, this is a uh, one way of comparing the complexity of uh, two different types of algorithms, let's say, okay? So Oracle is something which says that, oh, I have a black box access to a particular problem, okay? This is not the same problem that we are uh, like com measuring the complexity of, but let's say we have a quantum, we have a problem that can be solved using quantum computers. We have a problem that can be solved using uh, classical computers. And let's say they both uh, assume Oracle access. So uh, the complexity here is the researchers, they feel that this is a natural model to separate the power of uh, two different types of either the class of functions or two different computing models. So this has been the natural model to do the power of quantum computers over the classic computers over the last uh, two, three decades. So we'll use this. Uh, Grover's and Shor's also will use the same category. 
All right. Now let's get into the get into the presentation on Grover's algorithm. Any questions before uh, coming forward? No, sir, I don't think so right now. Okay. Yeah, you can cool. continue. Thank you. Thank you. Okay. So what is the problem that Grover's algorithm is trying to solve? I'll first give a high level description and then uh, propose a slightly more formal uh, version of this problem. Okay. We have a list of n elements. One of them is special. So it's marked, let's say, as uh, even though it's omega symbol, I will call it W from here on in the presentation. So one of them is marked. One of them, uh, the, the element W is special. The goal of uh, or the solution to this problem is about finding this W. Okay, so in a slightly more formal term, we have a list of n elements, let's say xi, x1 to xn, or maybe later I will call it x0 to x uh, capital minus 1. Actually, I think this is a typo. So this is capital N is equal to 2 to the small n. Okay, uh, yeah, so we have uh, 2 to the n or a capital N number of elements. And we have a black box uh, access that is oracle to a function. Okay. And this function captures what this element, special element W is. Okay. In particular, this function on input uh, an X in an input an element from the set, it gives one if and only if the input is W, the marked element. Otherwise, it's it outputs zero. Okay, so it's just some way of representing uh, what this marked element is. Okay, so the problem is that given a black box oracle, uh, black box access to an oracle implementing this particular function, specific to W, we have to find the marked element W. Okay, so this is the problem we are trying to solve. Uh, we can also have a generalization where we can have multiple marked elements. We find one of them, more of them, and so on. But yeah, so for the simpler uh, depth, uh, version of this problem, we'll have black box access to the article and we find the marked element W. All right. So, what is a classical way of doing it? I told you that the data is unstructured. Okay. And we just have black box access to the article. Right. Uh, black box access to implementation so that we cannot do anything better than querying points randomly and then hope that we hit the point w right if you allow for average case which means that if you allow for random uh randomness in the algorithm and if you allow for uh, uh like failing with negligible probability i think we can do it in n by two time we can query n by two points and then find uh, find the marked element W with uh, overwhelming probability, with probably very close to one, right? But if you're aiming for the worst case, if you want to solve it probably exactly one, we, we're not even allowing an negligible error, uh, negligible probability for failing, then we need to query all the points, right? That's a classical argument. What Grover said in 1995 is that there exists a quantum algorithm to solve this problem using square root n queries to the article, to the quantum version of the article, okay? So, in fact, uh, he showed a concrete algorithm which can make the square root n queries to the article and find the result. okay? So this is, uh, I mean, simply to describe. Okay, so given that it's square root n, and uh, even an average case since the classical world took n queries, so, or O of n queries, theta of n queries, in fact. So, we have a quadratic advantage over uh, the classical way of computing. Okay. So, this is square root n in that sense, so that's why we call it a quadratic advantage. All right. So, I told you that, uh, yeah, now we are into the details of the algorithm, right? We're starting into Right. Uh, we are just setting up some basic terminologies and notations before we go into the steps of that. Okay. So the first 
thing to know about is how do we define the Oracle? So I told you that the Oracle implements a function uh, which on input W outputs one and on input uh, any input other than W it outputs zero. So how the Oracle is defined, right? This is typically, I think, the same way that uh, as Arjuna mentioned yesterday, Deutsch Shosha and Gunshin Vasanani. So typically we'll have a controlled uh, implementation of an Oracle. So uh, I will explain in detail, but as if you remember from yesterday, the notion of phase kickback, uh, it's like if the function, there will be a phase that's coming out of it uh, after you apply an article. And uh, yeah, so that's how this article is defined. But for now, you can just look at the definition of the article. We'll see why it's defined this way and uh, yeah, how it helps us achieve the speed up and so on later in the presentation. Okay. So Oracle implements this function f, and in particular, the Oracle on input x, it will output minus one to the f of x x. I'm actually ignoring the ancilla extra qubit here, uh, which is a minus state, which will facilitate this. But for the first uh, first register, so Oracle on input x, it will give minus one to the power f of x, or uh, to be more precise, the Oracle on input x, it will give x the same x if x is not equal to w. And it will give minus x if x is w. So this is, yeah, this is just the implementation. This is just how the oracle is defined. And uh, yeah, this is one thing I will not go into detail on how it's easy to efficiently implement the oracle in a quantum computer using just like linear number of gates. Okay. Uh, I mean, uh, yeah, logarithmic number of gates. In fact, sorry. Right. So. That's something you can look at like a skip textbook or uh, any other material. But for now, we'll just assume a black box access to this order. So this is part one. Uh, so this is one of the things that we'll need as building blocks. Uh, right, okay. I mean, this is just a matrix formulation of, uh, so yeah, this is matrix formulation article. So one question I see in the chat is, what is f of x, right? As I mentioned here, f of x, it's just, uh, f is something that embeds the element w, okay? Uh, it's just a function representation of w. Because here, when I say that, oh, I have to find w, there is no, uh, I don't know, I don't know what the terminology I should use, but there is no, like, uh, let's say, a function which, when given the list gives W. So this is an easy way of uh, indicate, maybe you can call it the indicator function, right? Uh, F is the indicator function, which when you input the element that you care about W, it outputs one and for any of the elements it outputs zero, right? Right, so that's what the function F is. And right, this is the matrix representation of this arc. So let's say, for example, if W is one, zero, one, uh, so I think, I mean, zero, zero, zero till one, 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 right? That's what the rows correspond to. So for one, zero, one, the corresponding element, it's minus one, but for all the others, it's one. So which means that uh, it retains the input. I mean, it's identity function for all other inputs, except for this particular uh, input, there's a uh, phase minus one. It's coming. All right, now let's get into the first step of uh, Grover's algorithm. I think next slide probably I will have some more notations, but let's start with the first step. First, or in fact, zero step. What is the input that we will provide to uh, Grover's algorithm? It's simple, actually. For the first n qubits, uh, where n is the log of the number of elements used, right? So you can, let's say, if, let's say the number of elements used the power of two, let's say it's, uh, Two to the n elements, right? You can just represent them from zero, zero, zero. Oh, sorry, I mean using log n bits, right? For example, if you have sixteen elements, you can write it from zero, 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 zero till one, 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 one. So you can have uh, sixteen elements. So uh, in that way, in that sense, so it's sufficient if you have the first or uh, use uh, log to the number of elements in the set number of qubits, and we start with them being zero, and then. As we saw yesterday, a similar for the similar purpose, we'll have an extra ancilla qubit that's uh, set to one. I mean, you can either start with zero and apply an X gate, or 
Det är klinisk eller stora. Ok? This is step zero. Right. Before we get into step one, there are some more notations. Uh, yeah, just reiterate. We'll have the mark index at, as uh, get W. And then there is uh, this state, which is the equal superposition of all possible states, right? In fact, if you apply Hadamard on all the qubits for uh, a state which is all zeros, then that essentially gives us equal superposition of all possible uh, states from 0 to minus 1 or 0, 0, 0, 0 till 1, 1, 1, right? Uh, so this particular state, we will represent it by the notation S, okay? Right, so this is the second notation. First is W. Uh, in fact, if you think about it, W is also one of the elements here, right? W is just one of the special elements uh, in X because this is all possible X. So this also includes W. And uh, if you think about it, each element X, uh, I mean, if you measure S, each element X, you can obtain with probability one over N, right? So each element X, we can obtain with probability one over N, equal probability, there are N capital N elements. And when you measure the state S, uh, the probability for any element to for you to obtain any element is one by n. Any element that includes w. So the probability for uh, getting w is also on one by n. Okay. The reason I'm saying it is the next notation s prime is essentially the state s that's perpendicular to w. Right. So it's the projection of state s without uh, in an axis perpendicular to w. Right. So we have to renormalize the vector. So there are n minus one elements. So we renormalize them to one over root the root of n minus one. And you you still sum over zero to n minus one, but you exclude the element w. Okay, this is a state s prime. If you look at it in the two-dimensional like projection, this is essentially what it looks like. Right. Uh, let's say uh, you have the, the state S prime in the X axis and the state y, uh, W in the Y axis. Since, I mean, I told you that S prime is essentially S without W, which means S prime is perpendicular to W, right? Uh, or one other way of saying it is the like amplitude of projection of W onto S prime is zero, right? That essentially means W is perpendicular to S prime. But uh, S, is it makes some angle theta uh, between W and S prime because it's S is essentially S prime plus W normalized, right? So S is uh, it's S makes some angle theta. We'll look at what theta is in the next slide. But S makes some angle theta with uh, S prime and 90 minus theta with W. Right, uh, as I mentioned before, like in the state S, each of the element have equal probability one over n or correspondingly equal amplitude one over root n. Right, theta is the angle between S and S prime. What is theta? Or, I mean, another way of representing S is given that the angle is theta, uh, remembering from the basic trigonometry things, the W, which is opposite, right? I mean, we'll have adjacent and opposite. So. Let's say let's, let's look at S prime, which is the adjacent uh, to the angle theta. So the projection of it will have cos theta times S prime. That's the amplitude of uh, S prime in S. And in the other thing, uh, it's sine theta. The, it's opposite side. So it's sine theta is the projection, uh, amplitude of projection for uh, W, say W. Right? Okay, so now that we represented this way, if you are looking at, let's say we uh, apply bra W to both sides, right? If we do that, so W uh, process, so that's the that's what we uh, W in a product between W and S or S uh, and W. So W and S prime is it will cancel out at zero. So we'll just have the sine component remaining. So theta is just sine inverse of uh, yeah, this value, the product of this. 
right? Uh, arc sine is the sine inverse. So sine inverse, and since we know that uh, the projection of uh, S on W is one over root n, uh, yeah, so it's a sine inverse of one over root n. And typically for large n, sine inverse of something is approximately equal to the number itself. Uh, though it's just for understanding, I mean, we won't really use this approximation. But uh, for very large values of n, if you remember, sine theta is approximately equal to theta. Right. So, right. So this is this is for understanding. I think uh, exact value of theta we will just use it at the last step just to figure out a calculation. But the thing that S makes an angle theta with S prime and uh, W and S prime are perpendicular is something we will use like inherently in the in the description of the algorithm. All right. So first step. As usual, as in most the quantum algorithms, uh, we start with applying the Hadamard transform because that will like have a superposition of multiple states, and uh, this, in general, like uh, yeah, I mean general principle, right? In many quantum algorithms, we have a superposition of uh, states as input, and the superposition will have one of the elements that we actually want as output. The goal of the rest of the algorithm will be to amplify the probability of that thing uh, that we want to output and reduce the probability for the others that we don't want. Right? So that's the goal of most quantum algorithms. So here, uh, we start with applying the Hermann transform and uh, we, yeah, which essentially returns the state yes, which is the equal superposition of all possible states uh, X. Okay. Next, this is the first core step of inverse. Okay, I think when I this step, we try to rotate this state by an angle two theta. Right. So what I mean here is we start with the state S. This is the initial state because after I apply Hadamard, we apply the we obtain the state S, which is the equal superposition of all states. And the goal of our the rest of the algorithm is to apply something, apply some set of gates so that the state becomes W. Right? Because that's the state that we want to output. So the goal of the algorithm is to rotate this state S into W. I mean, rotate or do something so that the state S ends up in state W. And what we'll do is do it by a set of rotations. Okay. In particular, we'll there are many sub steps. Each rotation we will do it with. Uh, I mean, each rotation we'll do it by angle two theta two theta, which eventually will reach W. Right. The main idea that Grover had is the point that a rotation can be implemented with two reflections because rotation by itself it's not uh, easy to obtain. Uh, sorry, easy to uh, directly implement over a state. Uh, it's not clear how to do that. So what he thought he can do is he will, yeah, I mean, right, this is a state that we have, right? So we have the state S. So in this slide, I will just explain the statement that I made in the previous slide that a rotation can be implemented by two reflections. So just ignore the details of what angles that we rotate and so on that I will uh, look at in the next slides. But in this slide, let's just look at why, how a rotation can be implemented with two reflections, okay? So this is the state that we have, state S. This is this makes an angle theta with S prime. So first reflection that we do is about S prime. So this state S, the next state after the first reflection is this one, because we reflect about this S prime. Uh, S, let's say, let's, yeah, so the reflection will move it here. And now, the resulting state that we have, we will reflect with the state S, right? So the thing, this thing now moves back here. So since it was initially theta and this again theta, so this angle was two theta. So now when you reflect by S, it will gain two theta, right? 
So that's what uh, this step step two of Grover's algorithm will do is to rotate the state s by an angle two theta. The rest of uh, the description, I'll talk about how to implement at a high level uh, this reflection and the second reflection. All right. The first reflection is actually just applying our RFA. Okay. Why is it so? Because as I described earlier, uh, the description of an article is uh, on state S. In, in fact, uh, yeah, as I mentioned before, I should have uh, applying the oracle on X and uh, the ancilla cubic to be minus state. We will have minus one to the f of X, X and the minus state. But just focusing on the first n qubits, uh, the oracle transforms the first, uh, sorry, first register n qubits into minus one to the power f of x. Okay, so which step do you want to explain again? Oh, explain the phase again, okay. Right, uh, okay, so, oh, two theta, okay, okay. So, no, maybe the fact that the angle is two theta is something I'll, again, anyway, explain with the rest of the presentation, but, the only thing you need to know from get from this slide is that if you want to rotate a particular state by some angle, right? Uh, you can do by first reflecting about a particular vector, right? So here we reflect by the vector. Uh, let's say let's even forget these as quantum states, right? So this is a particular uh, vector that we have in the x y axis, and then we want to rotate this vector by an angle two theta about uh, like farther from x axis, let's say about origin, right? So what we do is we can first reflect this vector about, uh, uh, yeah, about x axis, right? So that way it is rotated, it comes here, and then next next step we reflect it about it still itself, the first state that it was uh, presented, right? So once we do the reflection of the resulting state uh, about this. We like get here, right? I mean, I think that arrows uh, give a good understanding, right? So, reflection about uh, S prime is the first step that we do, and uh, I was explaining reflection about S prime can easily be obtained. I mean, applying applying the oracle is exactly what it means to reflect about S prime. Okay, uh, I think. It would have been better if I had gone into more details of how we do this, but uh, that will take more time. It's hard to fill into like this lecture. So, but it's not hard to see. It's just like set up some steps that you follow. Like each step is easy to in itself, but if I explain step by step, it will take some time. That's why I'm skipping. Uh, right. So, but at a high level, why does why does why is this so that applying article is reflecting about S prime? Is that S is a superposition of all possible states, right? And uh, if you reflect re reflect about S prime, I think yeah, I think this this one gives a good understanding. So uh, S is a equal superposition of all possible states, and S prime is everything in S except W. So only the component with respect to W that's present in S, the amplitude of that will go down. Okay, so when you reflect about S prime, right? If you look at it, this one will go down because, uh, okay, maybe let's come from it the other way. If you re reflect about S prime, right? This vector S will just go down here uh, like this. What that means is that every other component of S will remain intact. It's just that the component with respect to W gets uh, like the negative amplitude, right? Because W is perpendicular to S prime and just the component with respect to W that's present in S will get a negative amplitude. And that's what we did, right? That's what the Oracle was doing. It said that only if uh, the state input is W, it will uh, have add an addition, add uh, like let's say minus a negative sign to the, to its amplitude, but otherwise, uh, or phase, otherwise it will remain as is, right? Uh, 
right otherwise it remains identity so there is one more thing i want to emphasize here right so given that this is in fact the implementation of an oracle just applying this is sufficient and this is uh, like i'm saying it in a single step i mean uh, for a state x but if we have a superposition of all possible states like we have in state s then that means that we'll have summation over all possible x minus 1 to the f of x x which means that just when f x is w so just there will have minus sign others it will just retain the plus sign which is exactly this step. okay all right next step next step as i mentioned we will do a reflection about s i mean in theory we could have reflected over any possible vectors right the i mean essentially what we want to do at the end is we want to move this state s to state w so there is a specific reason why grover first reflected with s prime and then reflected with s that's because it's easy to implement that those two reflections in an efficient way right i mean we could have thought about arbitrary other reflections also or direct rotation right but uh, the re reason that grover used these two reflections specifically is that it's easy to implement and we saw that the first reflection is easy because that just follows from the oracle and the second reflection implementation of it is just this state okay uh, again i mean if we just like spend some 10 minutes and then uh, write out the set of equations we'll see why this represents why this uh, operator why this unitary operator represents uh, a reflection about state s maybe uh, to provide some primitive understanding i'll say that if you want to reflect about a particular vector if you're re reflecting that vector itself it's an identity operation right so for example if you are reflecting about x axis and if your original vector was about x along x axis already then reflecting about it will not cause any change to it right so similarly since this reflection about s if you apply this operator on state ket s We'll just have two times ket s minus ket s, which is just ket s itself. So that's an identity operation. And similarly, the next thing, if you have a vector along y axis and if reflected about x axis, right? If you have a vector along y axis and reflected about x axis, which means that there will be a negative face that's coming out of, right? So similarly, okay, that's something risky I got into. So what is, uh, I'm trying to think so what is the perpendicular right oh nice yeah so if we have a state that's perpendicular to s we don't need to know what exactly that state is that's called s double prime but we know that the inner product between s and s double prime is zero so if you apply this operator on state s double prime then uh, for the first component there will be s inner product s double prime which is zero so the first one will vanish so we'll just end up with minus of uh, state s double prime right so at least that's at least the endpoints are fine. That uh, this says that this is an operator. Uh, this is like a primitive uh, like verification that this is indeed uh, an operator for reflecting about S. But even for general states, if you apply, you can uh, like see it easily. I think you can. Yeah. Okay. So yeah, to recap again, we have. Uh, state s which is equal to this rotation plus vertical superposition of all possible states i think one point i can say again here so earlier right it's quite early sorry it seems like i don't have the picture earlier what we had was uh, no i did just one second yeah so initially we started with state s which is which has a, every possible element x which is equal to a position of it so each of them have a similar amplitude right and the average amplitude is also one over root n but after we do the reflection the the amplitude corresponding to the mark state w becomes the negative of it 
right? Which means that the average amplitude reduces to something below one over two for the other guys, right? For the other states. And now, next step. After we apply this reflection about uh, S, just the value amplitude corresponding to W gets amplified. Okay. Why that's because is that we earlier at the end of step 2.1, after the first reflection, we were on this state, right? Uh, this is still equal superposition. I mean, uh, except that the the phase correspond the amplitude corresponding to W is negative, right? But still, the the probability for obtaining each possible state is the same. But after we do the second reflection, we are closer to the state that we want, state W. Okay. I think I mean now you would have seen that. Initially, we start initially the uh, thing S, the state S made an angle theta with S prime, right? And then uh, the first reflection made theta on the other side, like minus theta with S prime. And then totally with respect to S, the state was angled with two theta. So, which means that after reflection about state S, we have two theta on the other side. So, overall, we have two theta plus theta with uh, the state S prime after each. Uh, application of step three, right? And uh, I think this is not something I'm going to detail again. So it's easy to see that you can apply, in, uh, you can uh, implement this oracle. In, sorry, implement this reflection operator using uh, like a small number of gates. This again, you can maybe refer to the textbook for details. All right. Yeah. So the amplitude for the state W. Increases how oh, this uh, increases as we get more closer to W. Okay, so the question how is amplitude? No, I'm not saying that amplitude is doubled when phase is doubled, I'm just saying that amplitude increases. Uh, I'm not sure whether amplitude exactly doubles, I think there will be some sign uh, of this angle that's coming in. It's the angle towards W gets doubled. So it's like the amplitude initially was sine theta. Amplitude for W initially was sine theta. Uh, now it became sine 3 theta. Okay. And then after each uh, reflection, it becomes, uh, yeah, I mean, like it, you add angle 2 theta to. And then you apply apply the sine function. So that's the increase in the amplitude for W. The angle with respect to S prime gets uh, even that's I don't think it's the correct way to call it as it gets double uh, because there is extra theta coming in. But roughly it increases by two theta after uh, each uh, application of step two, and then correspondingly uh, it increases from sine uh, some sine theta prime to sine two theta plus theta prime after. Uh, Excuse me, sir. Uh, with reference to this slide, uh, one yeah. question is there here. Mm -hmm. uh, how many reflection would be required to reach W? And yeah. How can we yeah. ensure that? Okay, so I will come to that in the next slide. How many reflections we need? Like this slide, uh, what we can need to take away from here is that after applying these two reflections, we need to, uh, and the angle, it gets closer to the state W by an angle of 2 theta. All right, so this is a summary, right? We first reflect by S prime and then reflect by S prime. Good. So theta, as I mentioned before, is approximately one over root n. I mean, it's exactly sine inverse of one over root n. And after one step, the angle of state with respect to W is two theta plus one. Ah, oh, sorry. Oh, ideally, it's three theta. Sorry, it's a typo here. Uh, yeah, oh, I guess, sorry. I think the next slide will also have a similar type. So this is two theta plus theta, right? So that's the, uh, that's what's the angle that's there with this. But then let's say the step two is essentially just repeating this uh, multiple times, right? Let's say we repeat it T times. We'll figure out in the next slide what T is uh, supposed should be. Right? Let's say we repeat it t times, and 
now let's figure out what this T should be. You know what? Sorry, it's just I need to get a little bit confusing. Give me a couple of minutes. I think it's uh, it's it's better I correct this now. Otherwise, the expressions I have are wrong. Yeah, okay. So this is kind of easier than okay. Actually, I think given that anyway, I'm modifying it, I can talk through this, right? Let's see, like after T steps, angle of state uh with respect to this is we know that it increases by two theta every time, right? Initially it's uh initially it was theta before we did anything, and then it's two theta plus theta. And then it's two theta plus theta plus two theta, right? So for every step t, uh, if t is one, it's uh, two plus one theta. If t is two, it's four plus one theta, and so, on, right? So after t steps, we'll have this angle as two two t plus one theta, and then eventually we want it to be pi by two. That's what we want, right? So we want two t plus one theta to be pi by two, which means that uh, it's pi by to theta and the minus one divided by two. Yeah. I guess like a half or something. It's right. Yeah, this is this. And then I think one more thing I can do is theta, we know it as uh, like sine inverse of. One over root n, or approximately it's just one over root n, right? So I think that we can even write it as uh, first, and then I will do. It's just pi by uh, two times square root n. One into one by two. Okay. Yeah, I hope I didn't make any silly mistakes while doing this, but roughly this is what you see like the angle increases by uh, theta, two theta every time. And then we need eventually the angle to be pi by two. So 2t plus 1 theta should be pi by 2, and uh, t is uh, pi by 2 theta minus 1 into half. And since theta approximately is 1 over root n, we'll need t to be this. Okay. I think this is probably one. Uh, yeah. This says that we need to, this probably this step already signifies that we need to apply the square root n operations, right? Approximately, if you look at this, T is the number of times we repeat that step two, and step two involves applying the oracle and another gate, right? So this essentially says that uh, we need these many pi by two. Okay, let's forget this minus one and let's include this half. So approximately, it's pi by four times root n number of invocations, right? So pi by four is also very close to one, right? So we just need Roughly square root and invocations of the uh, of this article to win, right? So T is uh, roughly square root n, and that's the number of times we need to repeat this after the article. But just to complete, right? So we know that uh, after uh, T steps, we are very close to W, right? Uh, and hence, what we do, we just measure to get the result that we want. So this will give the state uh, W that we care about. I think this completes uh, the description of uh, Grover's algorithm. And there are like actually interesting details on how the oracle is built and how the the next the reflection about S that's built. Uh, I think it will take quite some time if I go into the details of it. So I will refer you guys to the textbook for that. 
and also it's a very simple extension i think i mean essentially the same uh, algorithm but if you just modify the function accordingly right i told you that uh, we define oracle with this function so this function initially just output one when our state is w and zero otherwise but if there are multiple mark elements you just make the function output one for each of them that's marked and that our goal if it's to find just one of them then we can do faster than this because uh, there are here we just had it orthogonal to w uh, but there are multiple states that we can hit so if let's say there are m states i think it's roughly about square root of n by m uh -huh. so if there are more yeah it's either square root n by m or square root m that's correct but roughly that so if there are multiple elements marked and if you want to find one among them you just apply the same thing and i think there are other probably other variants of this problem also that can be studied yeah so that's about it with respect to grover's algorithm any question before I go into shorts. Okay. Yeah, actually, Kiskit textbook. Uh, so I'm asked if I can provide some references on how the Oracle is built. Uh, I'm just sharing the pop Let me just share my whole screen. Hopefully. Right. So I'm just looking at the, I'm just showing you guys uh, the Clover's algorithm page in Kiskit textbook. Where do they say? See, the device. Okay, okay. Where do they have it? Somewhere here. So they will have an explanation of an oracle with this. Oh, okay. Yeah, this is where they have. So initially, for two qubits, they say how, and depending on which element is marked, uh, they talk about how an oracle is built. And then uh, here again, they talk about how the reflection operator is built, right, for this particular uh, two qubit uh, scenario. I mean, the reflection operator, these two together, they call it the diffusion, okay? Yeah, like that link is uh, what Sesha pointed out is the link where I'm showing it. Uh, but like, Implementing the Oracle is uh, probably, it's not like there is no standard way. You follow these steps, similar steps, depending on what element uh, that you want to mark in the Oracle, but that will involve like nice exercise, like for every element that you, for every element that you like uh, create an Oracle for, there'll be a different optimal way of doing it. But for the reflection about S, which I call the diffuser, that I think there is a general way and uh, which you can apply irrespective of which element and which set that you are trying to find. You just care about the number of qubits. Okay. So yeah, you can look into this book for the implementation of uh, one uh, Grover's algorithm and multiple examples for implementations. Okay. All right. So now let me get into Shaw's algorithm. As I mentioned, I will try to keep it at a high level. So if there are any questions that you want to follow the next step, just uh, give me back to it. Okay, the goal of Schwarz algorithm, probably this is the most natural, uh, let's say classical description of a problem for which people have found an interesting quantum algorithm. Maybe that's also what caught the interest initially, right? Because this is a problem that people have studied for many years. In fact, let's say decades in some form or the other in number theory, by number theory researchers, right? They want to find, uh, okay, the input to this algorithm is uh, a number, a composite number M, which is a product of two primes, two distinct primes, right? So I'm just defining the way in which uh, short, sorry, RSA crypto system needs it. 
or a toned down version of what RSA crypto semic said. But this factoring algorithm that's proposed by Shark can, I think, be much more general uh, for factoring any kind of uh, numbers. Let's like look at this. So, input uh, is a number m, which is a product of uh, p and q, where p and q are distinct primes. The output we want to find a divisor. So either p or q is something we have to output. That's it. That's the description of the algorithm. Uh, sorry, the problem it's going to solve. And uh, one notation that will be useful the rest of the presentation that will be heavily used is the notion of uh, order of an element A in uh, the group of size M. Okay. So order of A with respect to M is the minimum number R such that A to the R mod M is 1. Okay. So let's look at some integer. Let's say, what should have been an example? Yeah, I think this will take two problems. Right. So, uh, like we have an element uh, 17, let's say. Okay. And then m is 5. Right. So, uh, like trivially, we'll know that 17 is 2 mod 5, right? 17 mod 5 is. Uh, two because uh, I mean that's a reminder after you do it. I'm, I hope you're comfortable with the term uh, mod, right? So that's what that's what uh, like the mod thing means. And then uh, the order of a here it's just that the minimum number r minimum nine minimum number of times you have to multiply a by itself such that uh, the number mod m is one. Okay. Uh, let's see. Yeah, let's do this. So three for if a is three and uh, m is two, or yeah, let's say m is four, two or four, two both the same. So three to the one is three mod m, three mod four. Yeah, so three mod four is three, but uh, three to the two, three square uh, mod four, it's nine mod four, which is one. Right. Uh, so the if a is three and m is four, r is two. So similarly, it's just you have to find the minimum r. Uh, yeah, it's not some arbitrary r. The goal is to find a minimum r that's greater than zero because zero also trivially gives one. Uh, so you have to find the minimum r greater than zero such that a to the r mod m is one. Actually, this is a very fundamental problem, but for various values of m, it's very hard to solve. In fact, if we can solve this problem, it's as good as breaking the factoring. It's as good as solving the problem that you want to. Let's describe here. Right? So this is called order finding problem. And uh, factoring can be obtained from order finding. That's like, uh, yeah, I'm giving a brief uh, intuition here, but uh, for this specific, Thing, but it can be more general. So, how does fact uh, order finding help in solving the factoring problem? Let's say a to the r mod m is one, right? We have found an r such that a to the r mod m is one. We know that m uh, is equal to p q, right? And since uh, a to the r mod m is one, uh, we know that a to the r minus one is a multiple of m, right? So that's when m divides a to the r minus one. So essentially what this says is that PQ divides A to the R minus one. And uh, like we know that X square minus one, we can write it as X plus one uh, times X minus one. So if R is even, right? If R is even, we can write uh, this as uh, A to the R minus one as A to the R by two plus one times A to the R by two minus one. So PQ divides this. Here, this implies that either P or Q should divide a to the r by 2 plus 1. The reason is, uh, I mean, you have to sp spend a few minutes thinking about it, but I will leave that as an exercise. Uh, it's not, it's impossible for both p and q to divide just this a to the r by 2 minus 1, because then in that case, r by 2 would have been the order and not r, right? So 
at least one of P or Q should divide A to the R by two plus one. And uh, right, so this is what, uh, I mean, here there are a couple of conditions that I've assumed that uh, R is even, so A should be chosen that way. And also there are a couple of things, right? But these are, I mean, these are not novel to the quantum algorithms. So I'm not going to this detail. These are like very, very standard, uh, like way of uh, factoring numbers. It's just that for this particular step, where order has to be found, there was no efficient algorithm to do it. Right? So the people knew for like many decades, maybe many centuries, that uh, you can factor numbers this way. But uh, this step, for this particular step, there was no efficient way to do it. And this is what uh, Short's algorithm was. Sean gave a quantum algorithm to solve this step in polynomial time efficiently. So I will focus on like the high level steps involved in finding the order. So we will look at the quantum algorithm for the order finding problem. Yeah, it's good. Uh, I think since Sesha is also here, if you can send, if you have any questions, you send to all panelists, uh, either I can take it or sometimes Sesha can also just answer it and text. But any questions at this point? Okay, I will keep going. Okay, so I, I told you in the previous slide that if you want to factor it's sufficient if you do uh, if we have an efficient way of uh, finding the order uh, finding the order or if you have an efficient order finding algorithm right how we use it is something uh, i ignored but if we have an order finding algorithm we can have an efficient way to factor numbers i'll go one more step in detail right i'm going to say that if we can do something called quantum phase estimation it's easy to find the order Right? So earlier I told you that if there is an efficient way of finding the order, there's an efficient way of factoring. So now I'm saying that, that if there is an efficient way of doing what's called a quantum phase estimation, then it's easy to find the order. Okay. So let me first tell you what quantum phase estimation is before seeing how it helps in finding the order. Okay, and I see a question on what is random circuit in quantum computing. So, uh, where does the question come from? Maybe did I not say a sentence in a better way? Because uh, can you explain that question in more detail? Yeah, Mr. Rajeshekaraya has asked this question. Uh, we'll unmute him. Uh, yeah. If yeah. you want to elaborate the question, he can elaborate. Yes. Yeah. See, you went through that. Okay, maybe I'll keep going. Uh, yeah, I think this this one is pretty. Oh, actually. Oh, yeah, yeah. Hello. Hello. Yeah. Hello. Yeah, yeah. We can hear you. Go ahead. Sir, I read about this in some article uh, when yeah. designing a, a variational quantum circuit. Okay. Uh, uh, I have doubt here. Uh, there is no uh, much explanation about uh, random factors. Uh, so, uh, is there any? Can I get any uh, further uh, information about uh, creating a circuit with a random circuit in quantum? Uh, maybe that's like like that's we don't need it in this presentation. So maybe I will take it at the end. Right, yes. that specific question. Yes. Uh, yeah. Actually, now that I'm thinking for this presentation, it's pretty. The next steps are pretty. Uh, like, uh, I have to say it carefully. So maybe I will identify logical points where I will stop for questions. Yes. Maybe intermediate yes. questions. I will. Uh, 
either say she can answer it or i will do it later because yeah. like till now it was like easy steps and we were also going to details right from now i'm going to go to high level so it's good to sort of have it in yes yeah, yeah? Okay. thank oh, you cool. yeah. all right so right i told you that factoring uh, we can do factoring if we can have an efficient way of doing finding an order and here what i'm saying is we can have an efficient way of finding order if we can do quantum phase estimation efficient right so what is quantum phase estimation we are given an operator u a unitary operator u i mean like a quantum gate u sorry and, sir uh, mute me madam uh, if you can mute me uh, it disturbs otherwise please yeah. mute me okay so we are given a unitary operator u and uh, we are given an eigenstate i mean uh, eigenstate uh, it's similar to what we see in eigenvector and eigenvalues right in full matrices so we are given a uh, uh, operator u and eigenstate psi such that u psi is e to the 2 pi i theta psi okay so here psi uh, for any psi that satisfies this expression that means that psi is eigenstate to u and e to the 2 pi i theta is the eigenvalue uh, corresponding to psi for u So, right. So, the goal of quantum phase estimation algorithm is to output, uh, find this value psi. Okay. So, given the operator u and an eigenstate, uh, sorry, eigenstate psi, find the value of theta. Okay. Uh, I would just like to note that this is a very general uh, representation of any. Like any eigenvalue, so we know that like quantum operators are unitary, right? And uh, like they also like, which means that the eigenstate is also a unit vector, right? And also the eigenvalue that we will come up with will also have uh, amplitude one. So e to the two pi i theta is the most generic uh, representation of. Uh, an ideal value that we can define. So it's not some restriction that we apply here. It just says that if we give some unitary operate for some unitary operator u, and if we have an eigenstate for it, uh, we can essentially find the eigenvalue uh, or the theta form of it, right? So this is what uh, the quantum phase estimation will do. Uh, this is the end to end circuit. Okay, maybe it's, yeah, I will anyway go through the steps at the end. Okay, as usual, uh, we start with uh, step zero is inputs is just all zero state. And here, as the ancilla, we have the eigenvector actually. Okay, uh, right. And then what we do is we apply Hadamard on the first uh, n. Actually, uh, I copy paste. I took a screenshot. So whatever I call it as n here in this picture, it will have its p. So it's both the same, right? Right. So we apply Hadamard on the first uh, e or n qubits, and then the last ancilla qubit we set it to the eigenstate. All right. Next step. This is uh, probably a core step of one phase estimation. Uh, so we'll have multiple of this uh, being applied, but let's say that one of the things that's being applied is a conditional application of this unitary operator that we care about u. Let's even forget the exponent here, right? So let's say that we have a conditional application of u on the eigenstate, right? We know that u psi is e to the 2 pi i theta psi. So here is one other way of looking at the phase kickback. I mean, the principle is the same as uh, you saw yesterday, but uh, there uh, we had the minus state here and there was a phase kickback which happened here. But if you look at it again, like earlier, yeah, like yesterday we had a minus state here and then we'll have the phase of minus one that propagated to the control gate. Here, we have the phase of E 2 pi i theta that will be propagated to the control gate. That's what happened. But I'll just briefly go through the steps. So here, 
uh, if you just care about the first and the last qubit, the first qubit is zero and then apply it had a mark, it's the plus gate, which is just one over root two zero plus one, right? That's what the first qubit is. And the last qubit is psi. Now, uh, I mean, just rewriting it, we can have it as one over root two zero psi plus one psi. Now, next we apply this conditional operator u. I think, yeah, let's forget this exponent two to the two t minus one. Let's say we're just applying u. If we do that, we know that like if the first qubit, the control qubit is zero, we don't apply the gate. So psi remains as is. But on the second part, if uh, if we apply, I mean, it's one, right? So we do apply the operator u, which means that we end up with the phase u to e to the two pi i theta. Right? Rewriting this, we can just take out this common state psi outside. So we have one over root two zero plus e to the two pi i theta one times pi. So we started with zero plus one and uh, relative phase was, uh, there was no relative phase. And here we have a relative phase of e to the two pi i theta. Okay, or uh, theta. So this is, if you think about it, this is essentially the phase kickback that we mentioned. So what basic back says is that uh, if you have a conditional operation that's being applied, typically for a C naught, uh, the control is supposed to influence a target, but here, what's there the target, the phase in it, uh, if you apply it in the Hadamard basis, the phase moves back to the control, right? That's why it's phase kickback. So the phase that was there in the second qubit, right? The phase that was supposed to be in the second qubit side, uh, given that we applied in the superposition of zero plus one, to do this property of phase kickback, the output state that we get is in the first control qubit, we get the state of zero plus e to the two pi i theta one. And in the target qubit, we get, we retain the state of psi. Okay. All right, so similarly, uh, I think initially I mentioned it's just, uh, yeah, we apply e, u to the power uh, two to the t minus one, we apply different powers of two, right? Uh, I think there is a specific reason why we do this, but ignoring that for now, we have a controlled application of u to the one, and then u squared, u to the four, u to the eight, 16, and so on, till u, u to the two to the t minus one. Okay, and if we apply u, I mentioned that uh, you, we get this specific thing, right? So zero plus uh, two pi i theta. Essentially, there was a two to the zero here, which I skipped in the previous thing because just two to the zero is one. And if we apply u square, if we apply u twice, uh, we essentially, we get this phase again, right? We get uh, e to the two pi i theta times e to the two pi i theta uh, well, as a phase, right? So we'll get uh, e to the two pi i two theta. And similarly, if we apply u, to, uh, u four times, we'll get two pi i, Four theta and so on till two to the t minus. Okay. In general, uh, and the last state will always remain as such. The eigenstate, like the last state, will remain psi. So in general, we can just combine all this and write in this one over root two to the n summation over all possible k. Uh, I see. It should be two to the k. Sorry. Yeah. E to the two pi i theta, two to the k, k k psi. Okay. So it's a typo here. So it should be two to the k. And uh, yeah, for k, oh, wait a second. No, 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 sorry, this is correct. It's like, essentially what we have here is that, right, right, okay. Just one thing to notice, if you look at this particular step, there is a control uh, applied here and there's a target here, right? So for this particular gate, we just care about the first qubit and the last qubit, and then, for the next step, we just care. For the next step, we just care about the second qubit and the last qubit, third qubit and the last, qubit, and so on. For each step, we just care about like that first particular qubit and the last qubit, right? But then, eventually, at the end of it, you will end up with the first uh, thing being first qubit being in this state, the second qubit being in this state, the third qubit being yeah t to the t minus three, and the last but one qubit being in uh, zero plus e to the two pi i theta this one and the last qubit being in state side. So if you multiply, I mean, 
like it's essentially saying that this cross product, this cross product, this, right? Because that's what each of these states are in. So uh, this is an expression. It's like easy to see if you write it down in detail, but uh, I'm just like skipping some steps here. But we have these states, and if you represent it as a single uh, thing, so k is a, a t qubit vector, right? So for all possible k from zero to two to the t, which is capital N minus one. Uh, if you want to have a common way of representing it, that's like a, just like a tensor product of all these states in the vector, right? So if we do all this, I'm skipping that step, we'll get one over root n, sum over all possible k from zero to capital N minus one, two to the t minus one, e to the two pi i theta k, 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 k. Right, so, right, this is one of the big steps that I'm skipping, but this is this leads to the operation of what's called the quantum Fourier transform, right? If you guys know about, maybe I will show it for those who already know it, but for someone who doesn't know, it will take quite some time to uh, understand what that is. So if you're familiar with uh, discrete Fourier transform, right? Discrete Fourier transform takes in a vector x and then it out it maps it to a vector y of this form, right? There are Fourier coefficients associated with it. Uh, like let's say if uh, like where omega is the nth root of unity, right? I'm just recapping for those who know it already that you can map it to a quantum Fourier transform, right? Otherwise, I refer you to this. Chapter is like uh, on quantum Fourier transform. Then quantum they iteratively build on it. They first talk about Simon's algorithm, which gives uh, the textbook just the textbook. It first talks about Simon's algorithm, which gives some of the intuition behind uh, Schwarz algorithm. Right. If, in fact, if you look at the circuit form uh, end to end, it will look very similar, except for one chain. Right. So it, I yeah, the good way of reading this in detail is first read Simon's algorithm, then understand quantum Fourier transform. And then see how it's used in quantum phase estimation, and then see how it's quantum phase estimation is used in short cycle, right? Right. So now, for those who know about discrete Fourier transform already, right? This is uh, the Fourier tra discrete Fourier transform is converting a vector, mapping a vector into the, its Fourier basis, right? Uh, so depending on uh, which end that we use, we have uh, nth, nth root of unity, which is omega, right? And uh, uh, this is the expression that we do to convert uh, uh, an element, a vector in the standard basis to the Fourier basis, right? So what quantum Fourier transform does is to do this efficiently, right? So that's the main advantage of a quantum uh, Fourier transform, right? Due to the superposition principle and after, like implementing a quantum Fourier transform, uh, if if we had done it in a classical way, I mean classical Fourier transform, I think you require about exponential, uh, like O of n qubits. But I think the quantum Fourier transform, you can do it in log capital N with some constants. But uh, yeah, like there is a a good speed up when you implement the Fourier transform in the quantum regime, and that's why it's very interesting. But the expression for a quantum Fourier transform is essentially like the same uh, as what you have in the uh, classical Fourier transform. Uh, right. So for those who know it already, so we have the if we have a state X, right, which is of this form, state Y, I is just uh, sum over all k y k k k, where the Expression y k, the coefficient is exactly the same as what you had in the classical region. Right? And hence the quantum Fourier transform, you can think of it like it's doing this map of it converts a uh, it uh, maps a state j into the state of this form one over root n summation over all k omega to the power j k k k. Right? Uh, a simple version of quantum Fourier transform, the two qubit regime, it's just the Hadamard transform. So in two qubit, Hadamard is essentially doing the QFT operation. But for, I think they have a matrix form somewhere. So it's not. 
yeah i like i encourage you to like go into this uh, chapter if you want to know more details about what a Fourier transform but two things to know about is it's essentially very similar to the classical uh, discrete fourier transform or fast fourier or uh, discrete fourier transform let's say it's very similar to that but we can implement it uh, very efficiently using a quantum computer so these are two things we want to know about sorry uh, the quantum fourier transform but what happens here is now that if you see this expression in the quantum fourier transform uh, regime what did happens here is after you apply the inverse of a quantum Fourier transform on the state that we have. So this was a state that we had at the end of applying all these conditional operators, right? So after we apply this, it gives, it results in the state 2t uh, theta times psi. I mean, uh, 2t theta in the first register and the psi in the second register. Okay. And now if you measure it, we essentially get uh, theta. Theta is what we wanted, right? Theta is what we wanted as output of the phase estimation algorithm. So two to the t, it's just like uh, I mean, t significant digits. So theta may not be a uh, let's say I don't know. Yeah, theta can have like uh, multiple decimal digits, right? So the after when we do this, we get a decent approximation of the first uh, few bits of uh, theta. I think there are certain probabilities I'm ignoring here, right? Uh, but with very high probability, we'll get the most significant bits of uh, the value theta. Okay, so now stepping back. I had told you that order finding can be efficiently done if we have a way to do quantum phase estimation. So in the last few slides, the previous slides, I just briefly covered a high level description of how quantum phase estimation can be done efficiently, right? I'm calling it efficiently because here are all the gates that you apply. So Hadamard is, I mean, a single gate that you apply. These conditional operations are also like very easy to implement in a efficient way. Uh, when I say efficient, right? So it's like, we just need to use the log of number of qubits. Uh, I mean, let's say if you want to factor uh, uh, n bit n bit number, right? You want to factor an n bit number. In the classical world, we need about two to the n uh, time algorithm. In the classical world, we just need like O of n, or I think n cube. So it's this polynomial in n number of uh, gates is what we require. Uh, I think. I will be able to say why it's just polynomial only if I go to the details of how each of this is implemented. But uh, as I just alluded to before, each of these gates can be just implemented with a polynomial number of uh, steps. And the QFT is also efficient, right? That's one of the core things also. Right? If you're using a discrete, in a discrete world, we need a exponential number of gates just for the step. So in the, in the quantum world, uh, we just need uh, like a, quadratic I think, number of gates to implement this QFT. So overall, we have an efficient way to implement quantum phase estimation, which means that now, given uh, uh, operator U and the state Psi, an eigenvector Psi, we can obtain uh, the theta if uh, when it's of this form, right? If uh, the eigenvalue corresponding to state Psi is e to the 2 pi i theta, then after using quantum phase estimation, we can obtain the phase theta. Okay, so now the reason why we went to phase estimation is that we want to find an efficient algorithm for order find, uh, for order finding. Yeah. So now I'll tell you how to find order finding uh, efficiently using quantum phase estimation. In particular, to start with, we will use this operator u. Okay. So okay, let's step, take a step back. So we, uh, to reiterate, quantum phase estimation takes in an operator u and an eigenvector psi as input and outputs theta. If you want to find phase estimation, we have to define this operator u and this state psi in such a way that theta has the value of the order embedded in it, right? Only then it makes sense. Like if we just use some trivial, uh, I mean, each 
uh, any operator, if you just use some arbitrary operator U and arbitrary like eigenstate psi, it it probably won't give you the value. At, uh, I mean, it probably won't have the value of order. So we have to carefully craft the operator U and the eigenstate uh, psi in such a way that the theta that we obtain at the end has the value of order that we want, right? So uh, yeah. So if you want to find the order of A with respect to M, right? We define the operator as follows. So the operator U on input Y, it outputs A times Y mod M. So this is the operator that we'll define, right? Good. So what is the eigenstate that we want to use in QP? One of these. We can of course have a trivial like eigenstate Right, which is the summation over all k, a to the k mod m. Uh, I mean, if you apply it, it's very easy to see that u, when applied on u0, will give u0 itself. Uh, I'm not going through the steps, but you can see that u, when applied on u0, it will just uh, permute, I mean, for different values of k, it will just permute elements. So. Essentially, at the end, you'll end up with the same summation of the states that you started with. So you applied on U0, even though U0 is uh, a candidate uh, for, it's an eigenstate, it's not useful because the eigenvalue corresponding to it is one, and it has no information on the order of R, uh, the order of A, sorry, which is the element R. Okay, next, what about, Another eigenstate U1, which is of this form. So eigenstate U1, it's summation over all k, e to the 2 pi i k by r, k to the k mod m. So if you work out the steps, you will see that it is again an eigenstate uh, for U, and it has uh, a phase, uh, sorry, it has the eigenvalue to be e to the 2 pi i by r. So, uh, I mean, theta is in fact 1 by r, right? So, the general notion, general term, if you just map it to the general thing, uh, theta is 1 by r. So, if we give u and u1, capital U and operator u1, eigenstate u1 as input, we will in fact certainly get uh, 1 over r. And from that, we can easily find r. But the challenge here is we cannot, I mean, we know that this U1 state exists, but without knowing R, we cannot construct this state U1. So that's a, like a cyclic problem that we ended up with, right? So we want to construct a state U1, uh, eigenstate U1 such that its phase, uh, its eigenvalue has the, term R embedded in it. But the problem is we cannot construct the state U1 without knowing what uh, R is. Okay, that seems like a cyclic problem that's hard to solve. But what Shaw did, he made a very nice observation that if you sum over all possible states U, that U0 is just a, uh, uh, summation over all k, a to the k mod f. u1 is e to the 2 pi i k uh, by r, and the state is a to the k mod f. And u2 is e to the 2 pi i 2k by r, uh, a to the k mod m, and so on. If you sum over it all for all possible states uh, us, where s ranges from, I mean, from u0 till ur minus 1, let's say. If you do a summation over all possible R, if you expand that equation, it just results in a state one. Nothing fancy. So if you just expand this uh, set of equations, like the states, they will cancel out each other. And then eventually you will just have state one. So what that means is that if you, if we use state one as input to the quantum phase estimation algorithm, right? If you use state one as input to the phase estimation, quantum phase estimation algorithm, 
it's as good as applying a superposition of all these states. Okay. So a superposition of u0 plus u1 plus u2 plus so on. So if you had just applied u0, you would have, uh, yeah, okay, right. You, it's equivalent to applying a superposition of all this. So interesting thing is, if you apply the superposition of all this, then the output of Q of T will also be a Q of T inverse, will also be a superposition of the outputs corresponding to each of those states. So what it means is the output corresponding to U0 is just one, I mean, theta is zero, and the output corresponding to U1 is one over R, output corresponding to U2 is two over R, and so on. So what we get is, uh, a equal superposition of s over r for every s ranging from 0 to r minus 1. Yeah, since this eigenstate was equal to the question, the output obtained using the, uh, the quantum phase estimation circuit will also have the similar superposition of those as inputs. Right, if you remember, we had obtained a 2 to the t minus theta, right? I mean, as I said before, t and n are the same notation. So belong to the, uh, refer to the same thing. So what we obtain here, theta is just uh, either zero or one over r or two over r and so on. And since we had this equal superposition of it here, we'll also have the corresponding equal superposition here. So summation over all uh, s, two to the n times s over r. And now, if we measure this, we'll get uh, uh, two to the n times s prime over r, for some random arbitrary s, for some random s, right? I mean, these s and s prime do not, don't link into the notations that we use in rows. So what I'm saying is like, we have equal superposition of all possible s to the n times s over r on measurement, with equal, each of them have equal probability, right? Each of them have the same probability one over r. So when we measure it, uh, we'll get one of these states uh, S prime over R, in fact, I should not have that get notation, with uh, equal probability, right? So this n bits, I think, Shaw also ensures that we have enough precision. So n is set in such a way that I think he says this is two n, in fact, instead of uh, just n. So there are two n bits that he applies, and then uh, we have this fraction S prime over R for some random S. So we don't know what S prime is, we don't know for what R is, but we have this fraction uh, S prime, we have this uh, decimal form of S prime over R uh, once we measure it. And then using very standard methods uh, in number theory, I think like some methods from 1600s, we can easily obtain uh, the denominator R. And also numerator S, but we don't care about it. So we can easily obtain the denominator R uh, with enough precision. Okay, so that, summarizes uh, the order finding problem, right? So R is the order that we care about and to, yeah, end here, factoring, as I mentioned before, the core step of it involves finding the order, right? And uh, as I mentioned before, Shor's contribution was finding a quantum algorithm for the order finding problem. There are many caveats that I skipped in the last uh, things. Uh, but, uh, yeah, at a high level, this is an algorithm that I mentioned that used to solve for order finding, which in turn, as I mentioned, uses quantum phase estimation. So from that, using this quantum step, we can obtain this order R, which we can proceed in this classical algorithm to output uh, the divisor uh, for H, which is one of the, fa which is actually a factor for a number M. So that concludes the description of Shard's algorithm. This is all the slides that we have. So any questions or any specific steps uh, that you want me to go over in detail? No, if you have a few minutes, I'd like to just walk through the Fourier transform. I think that is the critical element here. Okay. Do we have uh, time till 11.30? Uh, just want I to just walk through so. the, okay.
So maybe I can uh, grab the screen for a bit. Yeah, uh, thanks for it. Okay. Uh, can someone, uh, can the host may provide me share? Yes, sir. We'll do. Yeah, we'll do. Yes, it is done. Sir. Okay, thank you. So, what I'll be using the, uh, I'll just include the link here. So, this is the link I'm using. Uh, so, for folks who want to just follow through along, uh, you can bring that up on the side. So, quantum Fourier transform is the underlying principle that is leveraged in quantum freeze estimation, which then gets used in the short cell carbon. So it's good to get a good grasp of what quantum Fourier transform is. Uh, the theory part of it, I'll uh, partly skip, but I'll want to walk you through certain examples to get you a feel for it. Uh, but before we go do that, I'll just want to give you a, an intuitive background to uh, the Fourier transform. Many of you may be aware of it already, but for those who are not aware, we'll just give you a sense of what this is. So imagine um, uh, typically any signal processing that we have, we have some signal as a function of time. So this is what we could think of it as a regular way of representation where you have an amplitude and you have a time. Time is the x-axis and amplitude is there and this is the rough signal that you have. Uh, when you do a Fourier transform, you sort of ask the question, how do I build this particular signal as a summation of unique sinusoidal waves, for example? So here, um, think of this signal as decomposed into um, a signal uh, of certain frequency and amplitude and a phase, signal two of certain frequency, amplitude and a phase, signal three of certain amplitude and a phase. So let's just walk through a specific toy example for illustrative purposes. So here is a code um, which is showing, uh, we are first, just for illustrative purpose, we build a signal and then we'll try to decompose it. Note that uh, this is in time domain. Frequency domain is orthogonal to the time domain. So here, um, uh, the orthogonal axis is the uh, frequency axis. And the in that orthogonal domain, this sinusoidal thing, this is representing the amplitude. And this is the frequency of that sine wave. And this represents the amplitude of the second sine wave and third sine wave and so forth. When you have amplitude phase and the you know, signal, you can build any signal. Uh, as a function of uh, some, some over all these particular sinusoidal waves. So um, in this toy example, what they have done, um, just for illustrative purposes, they built a signal uh, out of uh, one hertz with an amplitude of three. Uh, in, all the, in the toy example, they have set phase to be zero. The second signal is four hertz uh, with amplitude one. Third signal is uh, seven hertz with an amplitude 0.5. So you can uh, build a sine wave of each of them and they add it up. And when you add up, you get the actual signal like this. So um, this is just to say, here is an example um, uh, signal. We want to decompose it into it in, in uh, what is the discrete Fourier transform of this. In a sense, what is the set of signals um, in the Fourier basis that represents this particular um, overall function or the signal um, the at hand. So discrete Fourier transform uh, takes you to the Fourier basis, basically. Uh, this is the function that represents that. Uh, what it is, how it is, is less, uh, less important, but the functionality of it. So when you do that transformation, you take this signal, you are asking what are the frequency components of that signal. And what you're trying to do is, you wanna do it such that you find it, um, uh, this is typically for uh, a repetitive function. Um, so when you do that, you get uh, in terms of frequency. You know, typically, you will get it uh, with respect to the 50% point, you'll get it on either side, uh, the Nyquist, uh, Nyquist frequency. Uh, but you will look at it the first half only, um, then you will see the actual value. So the same signal that we had about uh, from the time domain can be seen in the frequency domain in this way, where uh, you have frequency uh, one hertz, four hertz, and seven hertz respectively. Um, uh, with the amplitude of three, uh, one, and 0.5 respectively. 
so we could then uh, this is an orthogonal basis uh, to the time domain that is what we are generally used to there are many many applications of uh, 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 this in signal processing and etc quantum fourier transform is an analog of discrete fourier transform so what i wanted you to show is how would you go about understanding this in a more intuitive uh, sense so in this chapter that that explains this i would open this in the quantum lab um, just so that you can just play with it to understand what is going on. Um, so hopefully when this loads, I want to go to the portion which actually runs certain things and I want you to, to be able to do those. Okay. So So here, So let me actually go ahead and open that. Okay, so we hopefully have this open. Okay, so let's run these things. Um, so let's load it. And let's create a circuit. So we're going to pick a case where you have uh, three bits. Um, so let's just run it. I want to get to the portion where we can play with it a little. Uh, OK, so the processing, the later processing is done. OK, so let's go and run this. And then this is control phase, this is the rotation. What's happening? Just give me one second, let me see what's happening with this. Let me share my screen again. So recently they made a move from Jupyter Notebook to Jupyter Lab. So this one is taking a little longer than I anticipated. Okay, so hopefully this works. Let's execute this. Okay. Let's execute this. It's not wanted. And then this. So we should see Hadamard on the second bit. So we'll, I want to get to the portion where we actually want to do the QFT function. Okay. Uh, so here is the Q of T function from uh, the chapter. If you see, it is essentially a control rotation. Uh, so just as a basis for this, um, what this is, is um, control rotation. Uh, yeah, this portion. So what this one is doing is it's a two qubit operation. Uh, 
uh, if the control state is zero, you do an identity on it. So the like, you don't do anything. If the control state is one, you then do a rotation, which is a function of k. And that k is uh, you do a rotation with a power two power i over two k. So this two k essentially is coming from the bit representation. So you have any integer representation to a binary representation. Um, it's important to understand that translation of it, and that's where the two power k comes from. Um, so ultimately, we know that qubits are binary. And it takes value zero or one in terms of states. So the integer representation, which is what we had in the generic representation, needs to be translated into a binary representation. And when we do the binary representation, you know that least significant bit has two power zero, the next bit has two power one, and so on and so forth, or two, two power n minus one, which is the nth bit or the most significant bit. So when you expand the integer value in terms of its binary representation, you will get this two power k out. So in general, you see this uh, representation here. Uh, an integer n can uh, 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 xn uh, can be represented in its binary form in this form, where x1, x2, x3 are binary or bits, and you will have the corresponding two power uh, to accommodate for the binary representation of it. So just hopefully this works. So we'll just do a quick execution of these things. I want to show the quantum Fourier transform in terms of its behavior rather than anything else. Uh, let's go to the portion that is of more interest. Okay, so now let's go here. You can read up on what uh, the function implementation is, but we're going to use this scalable circuit is basically to drag and drop chain. Okay, so what this one is, it's implementing control phase on uh, n. You pass an n and pass the circuit object to it. It first applies Hadamard first, and then for each a uh, number from um, zero to n minus one, it applies a control phase corresponding to the bit value of it. So that in a sense is, um, if you had uh, the most significant bit, it has a dependency on all the uh, n minus one uh, bits below it. And if you go to the n minus bit, it will have dependence on n minus two and so on and so forth. So if you see the circuit representation of it, you have the Hadamard first, and then you control rotation based on the bit value of x2. Uh, then you have control rotation based on the based on the bit value of xn minus one all the way till n. The next x2 bit will have the same pattern. It's just that the dependency will be from n minus two through to um, two to n minus uh, one. Uh, so you have those many rotations. And finally, the last uh, MSP bit will have just the Hadamard. So when you do this, the representation will go from LSB to MSP will be from the lowest bit, uh, nth bit will be LSP and uh, this one is MSP. So you do this swaps to get it in the right order. Uh, what they were going after is X1 will be the MSP and Xn will be the uh, least significant bit. And so these swaps are done to get the right ordering so that you can uh, read it correctly, but you could have gotten the same thing in the reverse order at this point in time. So um, let's do some examples. I wanted to really get to some examples to understand this. So let's execute all these things just so that I get all the functions available. Um, all right. Um, okay. So you see here, um, uh, you have the Hadamard and then you have the control rotation, right? Uh, you see from this, the second bit, the third bit, and then you have Hadamard from the highest bit, the next bit, Hadamard, this bit, this bit, and then you do a swapping so that the order is reversed so that Q0 becomes the uh, MSP and Q3 becomes the LSP. Okay, so let's start from here. This is where I wanted to get to. So let's say your integer number five, and in binary representation, it's 101, as you know. Okay, so let's run QFT on this. What is this? Uh, so remember QFT goes from computational basis, which is zero one to a Fourier basis, which is orthogonal. So what happens when you do that? So remember this is one zero one. So you have to initialize your initial state in quantum circuit. All the initial state is defaulted to zero. So you want to have the list bit as one and the MSB as one. So you do an X on zero and X on one. Um, so you get the right state, initial state. Uh, once you have that, then you 
pass it on to the Fourier transform, right? So what you are doing here is uh, you are running this uh, to get the state vector. Let's run this. Okay, so now we are visualizing the same thing. Just confirm that it has to be one zero one. So in this case, it is symmetric, but you can see it's one zero and one, which is good. This is in the computational basis. The same number is what we want to see. What does it look like in Fourier basis, right? So what does it do? So it then uh, calls the QFT function. Uh, they uh, in the above they have implemented the same as I described. You apply the control rotation uh, based on the bit value. You will apply uh, two power appropriate uh, position of the bit. And so the MSB depends on all the other bits. Uh, so you have two rotations for three qubit case. And then you have for this Q1, you have one rotation. And then finally, you just have the Hadamard for this uh, final one. So now let's run it. Okay. So this is the representation. Remember in the computational basis is zero and one. Uh, this is the North Pole, South Pole B is the basis. Now you are in an orthogonal basis. Uh, this is the Fourier basis uh, that you are in. The MSP is pointing in this direction, uh, something like 135 degrees. If I take the X as the, the zero, you have 180 plus another 45 degrees. Um, the qubit one is 0.90 degrees with respect to X. Qubit is 180 degrees with respect to X. Okay, so now let's play with this a little bit just to grab grasp a sense of what this Fourier basis is, right? So let's start with what is zero. Uh, let's change this to zero. Um, let's, if I have zero, it should, uh, I need to initialize to zero so I don't have to apply any rotation uh, that is inversion rather. So it should be zero, zero, zero. Then uh, let's confirm in the computational basis, do I see 0, 0, 0? Everything should be pointing to the North Pole, which is true. Now let's do a Fourier transform. Right. Okay, so it applied that. Now let's look at the basis. So remember um, the control phase that we talked about, the basic element in the rotation, the control phase here. Remember, if it is identity, it's not supposed to do anything, right? And remember, when we applied the Hadamard followed by the control rotation in the case where everything is zero, uh, all the elements are zero, the control operation will not do anything. So the Hadamard will just be the only operation that will be done. So what that means is that zero, when you apply Hadamard, goes to the past state. So what you expect is everything should be in um, pointing to the X direction. So let's confirm our understanding that that is the case. So you can see that everything is now pointing to the X direction. Okay, now the baseline is set. Now let's change one bit and see what happens. So let's make it one. Um, so if I have one, so I have to apply the X gate to the zeroth bit. So let's apply that. So that I get zero, zero, one. Let's confirm that is the case uh, the block sphere representation. So you can see that MS. Uh, so let's yeah, it's one, zero, one zero zero, right? One zero zero. So let's flip. I want to make sure I'm getting the ordering correct. MSP, LSP. Um, okay, let's keep going. So Fourier transform it and then let's apply the. Okay, so what you see is that. Oh, I think I should. I'll change the order. So yeah. this is, I think. Maybe 010, be, right? Yeah, yeah. They're going from zero as the MSP and two as the MSP. So let's flip that. So zero, so left to right, MSP to LSP is what they are. Uh, so this is LSP and this is MSP. Okay. So that's the representation. Let's apply the Fourier transform here. And then let's then see it in the state space. Okay. So now what you see is that uh, you had uh, one, the MSB bit. In this case, the way you would want to read is the representation is left to right, MSB to LSB. 
So the, the uh, lower two bits uh, are not impacted by this. The upper bit flipped. Uh, it had a 180 degree rotation. Okay, now let's keep changing. So hopefully I get the MSP LSP right. So if I have two, then zero one zero. So in this case, there is there is no confusion. It has to be in one. So let's run it. And okay, so the middle one is one. So that is two. We apply the Fourier transform on that and let's look at what we get in the Fourier basis. Okay, so uh, remember the baseline when we had uh, one, we, this was 180 degrees um, and this one uh, is now rotating. So what is important to see is what is the rotation angle by? So when you make individual change, they rotate at different angles. And that rotation is a function. If you go look it up, hopefully uh, you will see that when you have that expanded out for different angles, the MSP will have a dependency on all the other ones. And based on the specific bit value, you will apply that gate, which means, for example, if uh, let's look at this representation. So this is a three bit representation. The um, MSP will have a dependency on just that one x3 bit uh, the next one will have a dependency on x3 and x2 um, and the last one will have dependency in all three of them so let's say we had applied five for example uh, then what will happen is it's one zero one so this will be applied and this will be applied and this will be zero so this will go away so you will eventually get a rotation of this which is two pi over uh, two cube which is pi over Four, right? So pi over four plus you will have pi over two, which is three pi over two. You will have a one for one thirty five degree rotation for this particular bit. Uh, in this case, if the number was five again, uh, here you know x two will be zero. This will go away. So here you will have a pi over four rotation, that is forty five degree rotation. And if you see here, x three is one, and therefore you will have a pi over uh, two pi over two. Uh, so 180 degree rotation. So the uh, MSP rotates by 180 degrees. Um, the next bit rotates by 90 degrees. The third uh, rotates by 45 degrees and so on and so forth. So based on a particular number, uh, numeral or whatever number that you're looking at, uh, the different uh, cubic will have different rotation. This is in Fourier basis. So this is uh, going from computational basis to Fourier basis. And the way you would want to understand it is what is the degree of rotation? And remember, unlike the computation basis, each the different bits will have dependence on different number of uh, computational basis states. And it is a function of a specific value of uh, the bit. So you go from when you go from integer to binary representation, you will have the two power uh, thing coming in. So you got to be careful a little bit about the conventions. So here, for example, this is the binary representation of an integer, right? Uh, so uh, you you go from MSP, which is Xn, to power zero, and then Xn minus one, and so on and so forth, all the way till MSP. So you can always represent any number in terms of this and these two powers coming because of the binary representation. So I just wanted to give you an intuition for it. Uh, so it's going to an orthogonal uh, basis where the rotation is happening. And the rotation happens, uh, the value, the amount of rotation is a function of what exactly is the specific value that you are looking at. And that will have a different rotations in it. And this is an orthogonal representation to the computational basis representation of a given number. So once you have that intuition, this is essentially rotating in this things with different qubits with different rotation. And uh, that's what is the Fourier transform that is essentially it does the same thing as what discrete Fourier transform does in classical. All right, I want to stop there. So hopefully you will be able to play with this a little bit more. This is a good way to understand uh, the Fourier transform. Uh, there is a theoretical part to it, but uh, this is more intuitive. You can run these things to see what is happening. You can actually run it in a hardware also uh, to understand uh, uh, the result that you get from actual hardware. What we saw was from simulation, which means there are no noise. 
you can run it in actual hardware here for different values and understand what is the result we get what is the fidelity that we get from current hardware okay let me pause here for any questions So what parameter decides the number of qubits? It's the value. Uh, so for example, if you want to factorize number 15, for example, right? Um, then two power four covers it. So four qubits is sufficient. Yeah, approximately. Like you might need it twice of that, but like approximately. Log of right. Correct. There's a question on what's the role of QFT in algorithms? Um, it has a wide, uh, in a uh, wider implication uh, today we saw uh, its implication to quantum phase estimation and then shores algorithm order finding there are many applications of uh, um, that is less popular shores is one such but there are many other applications um, in the number theoretic sense where uh, this particular order finding uh, gets utilized um, so i encourage you to go look up uh, some textbooks there for Additional applications, the popular one is Shores, um, uh, and um, there are many others, um, uh, including order finding that gets used in other places too. Uh, typically, these kind of uh, elemental transformations has a wide blast zone. Uh, it's just that um, the impact of it is uh, uh, is different. Uh, like Shores uh, got the kind of uh, reception it did because of it potentially breaking the RSA. And therefore, everybody got interested. But there are many other such applications uh, that leverages QFT at the base. Do we have any more questions? Uh, no, sir. No more questions oh. in the chat box. Okay, okay, okay. Then we formally close the session uh, uh, because uh, we have uh, another session coming up. Uh, so I thank uh, Dinakaran and uh, Dr. Shesha and Dr. Dinakaran for uh, such an intense uh, lecture. I know I, I understand the intensity of the content. So what spends, you know, since many of us are beginners in the domain, this definitely give us a lot of inputs how to approach the subject, okay, what would be the essentials and what is the pathway to understand the, the complexity in this. So it's a continuous process for all of us. So uh, with this background, you know, uh, we, we all work and uh, try to pick up, you know, the subject in a very fruitful way. So I thank uh, Dr. Shesha. He has joined uh, voluntarily for the session in the morning uh, with his busy commitments and uh, he has shared a uh, valuable knowledge. Uh, it's a very a, a, a good opportunity for all of us to listen to him again second time in the FTP. So thank you, Dr. Shesha, for joining us. And uh, Dr. Dinakaran uh, Vinayag Murthy and uh, he is uh, quite, you know, uh, presented the topic very well to all of us to reach the knowledge. So uh, I thank Dr. Dinakaran for uh, such a wonderful talk. So we hope to associate with you. Again, uh, uh, one more announcement from my side, please have a look into NPTEL program, uh, which is coming up from IBM. Uh, that would be a, a, a kind of reputation for all of us. So we'll register and uh, try to make the program a grand success. So. Thank you, Dr. Shesha and Dr. Dinakaran for our time. Yeah, thank you. Thanks for the opportunity to see you again. Thank you. Thank you. So I, I welcome Dr. Arpita Maitra, madam. Uh, she is a speaker for uh, the second session.